Hello, everyone. So I'm Thibault, currently a consultant developer at ThoughtWorks. I'm originally from Cameroon, Central Africa. So I'm sure some of you have heard of Eto, the soccer player. So he's one of, uh, he's a Cameroonian, and he's talking about getting people to talk about us in Europe and in the soccer arena. Today I'm going to walk you through a possible strategy to increase the reach and impact of your application using SMS and USSDs. So does anyone want to tell us what an SMS is? Yes. So short text message is a way for you to, so you send some text to another phone. So uh, you actually send a uh, text to another phone and you can get an answer back. Uh, does anyone want to s tell us what USSD is? Has anyone used his phone to check what the current airtime is on the phone? So something like, uh, let's do something. Where is my application? Exactly. So that's what USSD is all about. So it's basically every time you check your airtime on your phone, that's what you are using. So I'm sure everyone has everyone has done this at a certain point in time. So the screen currently is too big for me to show a demo, but it's just a typical thing you do on your cell phone. So you go, yes, I do some fitness from time to time. <laughs> when I'm not working, because it's important to stay fit. So there's still a lot of things to do on that side. So, so if you go on MTN, you do star one, four, one, star one ash you call and you get a menu so currently the focus has changed so but i'm sure everyone gets what's happening in the background and you answer so if i do i answer with one it gives me the air time on my phone which is not likely to be much uh, so something like 33 rand. Cool. And uh, I could have picked something else. And what the main difference between this and an SMS is, the interaction between me and the application on the other side is live. So I, when I send you an SMS, you can read it in one hour time, you can read it in the daytime. There's no way for me to control when I get and hear back from you. USSD is totally different because you act, there's actually a connection between the two machines that are currently interacting. So I send a message, I get a response immediately. So there's no lag and there's more control and it's more live, real time. So uh, those two features, so USSDs and SMS are features that you can easily add to your phone or to your application. So. Uh, when you develop your application, normally you work straight up on desktop, you work on laptop, so there's nothing to do. And uh, at least you build it for it to work there. And if your application is a web application, you are likely to get the application to work straight on smartphones also. And currently, when we look at statistics, so we look at usages of desktop, versus usages of mobile phone, we see that the trend is currently changing. So in the past 2007, most people were on the lap desktops, few people on the mobile phone or a cell phone. The trend is changing and currently, we are somewhere around here where the usage is about 50-50, but it's likely to change in the future. And you need to go follow the flow and take advantage of that. Now is the time for you to get your application to take advantage of that and get more people to know about your application. So as a developer, it might be an opportunity for you to get people to see how 
good a developer you are, how cool your application is. As a business owner, you mean that more people know about your application. And knowing about your application, there are different levels of knowing about your application. It might be just, just people knowing that your application exists, knowing that they can interact with it. Might mean that later on, they can go and use your application in the normal way. So getting more people to actually interact with your application. So now, how will people interact with your application? If they have a smartphone, interacting with your application is just a matter of making sure your application is responsive. So if it's a web application, when it's on a smartphone and the scale changes, it changes accordingly, and it gets things to work properly. So that's a whole set of things to do. So developers nowadays, request for application to be responsive is quite high. So for most of the developers, if your boss has not asked you to make the application responsive yet, it's likely to do that sometime soon. And that's a, something that we all need to get at. The other alternative is trying to target not smartphones, but targeting feature phones. So uh, the difference between smartphone and feature phone is a bit blurred. So there's no strict definition when does a smartphone become a, no, when does a feature phone become a smartphone. The main differences are in terms of on the smartphone, for example, the screen will be wide. If you are looking on, the, uh, you are checking a website, you see a lot of things. The pixel resolution is good. A feature phone might give you access to internet, but it won't look nice. You won't want to come there every day, and you won't want to show that to your girlfriend to see that's my phone. No, you don't want to go there. <laughs> so, uh, and there's also a price component. Uh, in terms of targeting clients. So you might want smartphones. It means that you'll be targeting people that are generally in the high end of the customer base. They get, they have a lot of money. They can afford the smartphone. But most of the population is not in that space. And if you want to get more people using your application, you shouldn't be targeting only those. You should target everyone. So you should target feature phones for your application as well as smartphones. And we, if we look at the trends and at the statistics, we'll see that the, in terms of sales worldwide, there has been a change and in the recent past in smartphone have, have sold feature phone. So for, uh, that happened in Western Europe in the second quarter of 2010, where smartphone had sold feature, fo uh, feature phone. And that's happening that happened in North America in 2011. Even in Africa, when nowadays, if you want to buy a phone, you generally go for iPhone, especially with credit. So, those, that, so that change and that uh, change in what people are looking for is still is happening all over. So, if you see. In this graph, we see smartphone sales is growing up exponentially, but feature phone sales is still there. And overall, even in three years' time, feature phone sales represent just under 40% of sales. So they're still, they're still uh, you should see go for those. And remember that even on smartphones, if you get your application to interact and be able to be used through SMS and USSDs, Smartphone will be able to use it. Feature phone will be able to use it. So you have a larger customer base. So when we look at uh, developed countries versus developing countries, we see that smartphone sales represent roughly 50% uh, of sales in developed country against 20% of sales in developing country. So we, yes, we are buying smartphones, but we are not buying them as much as somewhere else in America and in Europe. And in terms of connection, of, as a whole, so in terms of cell phones, the penetration and the number of connection in Africa is constantly increasing. So. Uh, interacting through cell phones is definitely something to look at. 
because the customer base there is likely to increase. And getting your app to tap in that space early on is something that you can profit from. So meaning that you get actually the opportunity to learn and by the time everyone will be coming to the party, you, are, you would have had the experience already. Because everything in development, it takes a time and it takes a while to get comfortable and know what's good, what's bad in that space. So let's now focus on Africa, so not worldwide. So if we look only at Africa, most of the 4G phones are, represent the smartphones. And in Africa, cells of most of the phones are feature phones or basic phones. So basic phones typically will be phones that uh, just do simple call and SMS. There's no internet access. It doesn't handle MMS. Nothing too fancy. So just the basics. And in terms of cell, so the, the trend is likely to stay on for a while. And one of the advantages of using USSD and SMS is everyone will be able to use it. Even in remote areas, you get people a hunter, you might not know about the car, but you will be, have access to your application, which is always something good to, good to be in this position to, in that position. And overall, so, so far we have been talking mostly about cells. So if we look now at actual usages of phone, yes, the usages of smartphones is going up, but in terms Overall, in terms of the market share in cell phone space, there's still feature phone. Those are the ones that are dominant, and those are the ones you should be targeting first. Because if you can reach there, then that's a great thing, and you'll be gaining a lot from it. And when talking about smartphones, nowadays, you might have a smartphone, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you are using all the features on the smartphone. Like my dad, I've given him smartphones, I've given him feature phones. He keeps using the feature phones. He doesn't like the smartphone, he doesn't like touching the touch screen, no. And he's the one, uh, his generation are the one that currently have the money. So those are the ones you want to target. So, how do you get or add that feature, so the SS, SMS and UUSD capability to your phone? So currently in the Python world, there's quite a few options. And what we have used so far, we have used uh, Vumi and we have used Rapid SMS. So currently, Prickle is the Vumi creator. They are one of the organizers of this. So I'm sure most people know about Vumi, how to use it. And there's likely to be a lot of experts in the room. So I will give you, uh, we'll, go, we'll have a look briefly on both of them. Cool. So uh, let's go with Vumi first. So Vumi has been used in real life on many projects so far. We at work we used it on one of our projects, MPDegree, which is the one I'll be talking about mostly. MPDegree is a software that helps fight counterface drugs. So the principle is when you buy a drug from a pharmacy, how do you know it's the real deal? So uh, here in South Africa, not everyone might relate to that because getting counterfeit drugs at the pharmacy is quite rare. So generally when you buy it, there's no question asked. But when you go to a region like Cameroon, where I'm originally from, and Nigeria, where more than 50% of the drugs you buy from the pharmacy are fake. That's a real issue. So you might be taking something that's meant to make you feel better, and it's still, not only is it not neutral, so not doing you, not harming you, but it might be actually negative to you. So it's not helping you, but instead it's making you more sick. Empedigree is a way to help prevent that. And the principle is simple. Uh, from production, so from the warehouses where the drug gets produced, there's a sticker with a number that gets, uh, uh, that's put on the drug. And 
all the way up until it gets to the patient, there's a way for you to track and make sure, is this the real deal? Is, it, is the provenance real? Is it coming straight from the manufacturer? And what a system does is it allows everyone in the chain, so the producers, the, the people selling the wholesale of drugs, the pharmacist, and even the end user to be able to check and make sure, is this the real uh, drug? Yes? You can't do that. Uh, in, it's just like between the cup and the rubber. When the cup improves, the rubber improves. There's always a way around it, but you go step by step. So, yeah, so, so uh, I'm sure, and people are quite inventive, so I, I could have told you that you might lock it hermetically so that once it's open, you can't close it. But after, at home, and even after from with some Nigerian, I'm sure they'll find a way to make it look real. <laughs> so this doesn't solve all the issues, no. But it's a step in the right direction. So if we can sort that out, then it means that making sure that the hardware, so the actual drug and the packaging, prevents people from being able to swap is another fight. But as a software developer, that's not a fight. We can mention it to the, uh, we mention it, and uh, it's up to the client to take it over with the manufacturer. So it's at another level that that needs to be dealt with. And remember, if uh, we make sure that the fake drugs being actually consumed goes from, reduces down by 10%, that's already my main million of lives saved, which is already great. It's not a perfect solution, definitely. So uh, we have been using it on MP degree for the past one year and plus months. And what we did is we actually built our own standalone server. So uh, Prekel does offer a service where you go and subscribe, and they already have contracts with the different uh, telcos, and they can do... So it makes your life easy. You just make sure your application is in the background. You don't need to do any configuration. But we went the way of having our own server and doing everything on our own. And so the typical architecture of uh, Vumi, so I'm sure most, of, most people here will know. Uh, if you don't know, it's just it's basically a, you have a transport worker and you have a application worker. Transport worker is, basic, is generally um, you're taking care of the conversation, the dialogue between the external world, in this case is telecommunication, is telecommunication companies or end users that are using SMS to communicate with your application. And the application worker is the one that will actually do the processing. Because uh, you just bought a drug from the pharmacy, you scratch, you get a pin, you enter it on your cell phone, and you forward it to a given number. So a, a number that is provided. So we currently do that in Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa. So you forward in each country, depending on the network, you get a code you can send a message to. And the application responds to you telling you, is this a valid medicine that we are currently using or that you're going to use or not? So that's what we have currently implemented, and it, it has been in use for quite a while now. And Vumi, the textiles of Vumi, I won't bore you with that. So let's keep to connectivity. That's where Prekel offers the service. So, so it's quite, there's 10 countries where Prekel currently offers. So they already have contracts or understanding with the different networks there. Where if you want to use their service option, you can go there straight. Uh, what we, since we went the way of creating our own servers, the main pain point, pain point was actually getting that communication between the different telecommunication company and application to work. And uh, for the, from the get-go, the Precat guys were quite uh, useful, so they were always happy to help. And 
getting up and running on the platform, they took the time to show us how it worked, what needs to change. And our main pain point was getting actually the application to talk with the different telecommunication companies. Because you go to, in this case, let's say you go to MTN. How you configure your application to talk with an MTN user is not similar to how you con configure it to talk with a Vodacom user. The different, they are totally different parameters. So you might go here, what you need, you need the IP address and you need the gateway information. With MTN, it might be two, three uh, entries that you need to provide. With Vodacom, it's 10. And we haven't got a case where, where the body of the SMS was sitting was totally different from the others. So we spent weeks actually having to take the input, look at all the different entries, and look what looked like the actual message, which is something you don't want to go through. And it was really painful with a lot of administration on the telco com com uh, company side. So if you go on, so most, Vumi has a great tutorial online on how to set everything up. So I won't be going through an example here. So if you go Vumi, there's tutorial part one, part two, part three, which is quite straightforward. So you can use a virtual machine and actually go through it and get comfortable with it. But if someone has any specific question, I'm happy to answer them. And if it's more than me, I'm sure there's a prickle guy in the room that will be happy to answer it. So let's look at the second option in Python. So both options are in Python. They are both open source, meaning that you can actually get the code, look at it, play around with it, get comfortable. And Rapid SMS uh, gives you the option of only adding the SMS uh, capability to your application. Vumi gives you the option of adding a whole bunch of things. So there you can use Gtalk to interact with the application. You can use Twitter. So there's quite a few things. Rapid SMS is smaller in terms of what it does. And even if you look at the code base, the code base is not as clean as the one Vumi does. But for what they are doing, it's quite a, it's a good effort. And it's being used in a few projects currently. Um, Rapid SMS is Django based. So it's framework sitting on Django. And it allows you to build. So it, it does. Is you can use it as a standalone, so you can build your own server, get everything working. So you don't need to depend on anything for both of this framework, which is one of the things we liked about it. Because it actually gives you the freedom where you can sit and you have total control. If you looked, there are some commercial options like Twilio from Google that was released in April this year. That's a subscription only. So you don't have that freedom of being able to do everything on your own. You need to go and subscribe and you pay. And it's quite expensive compared to the other options. So that's why here I'm focusing on only on the more open source and the one where you can actually get dirty, sit and look at the code and see how it works. You can improve on it, change things if you don't like it. So uh, Rapid SMS architecture is slight, is different from that of, uh, is different from that of Vumi. In in Vumi, uh, in Vumi, you have workers, application, you get uh, the transporter that takes care of the communication outside. In Rapid SMS, you have backends, router, and you have this is the application. So backend is the communication with the outside world. And in Rapid SMS, what happens is the backend only takes in and send out HTTP. So if you want to do when to interact with SMS, you need to write uh, something else. So you need, in our case, we use kernel. So we, you can use that to, trans to transform the SMPP, SMPP messages into HTTP that the rapid SMS application that you worked with will take in. So that needs to happen outside of the application itself. It's not that complicated, so it's OK. So you can. So that's what you use, and it doesn't sit in the application. And the router does the processing. So it does the filtering, the message comes in, and it does everything. And uh, the application part is the one that you get something in, 
if you want to transform it, if you want to interpret it, you do, uh, you do it there and you send it back to the user through the router, then backend path still. So uh, since it's based on Django, some people will be more familiar and more comfortable with that. And it has a incremental aspect in terms on the application side, meaning that it's sort of waterfall structure where you can have actually multiple applications sitting there and the message comes in. If application one doesn't take care of that, then you send it through to application two, application three, which might come handy in certain cases. And one of the things that some, will, some people will find interesting is you can actually use both rapid SMS and Vumi. So the typical case might be as a back end, there's a Vumi back end that you can use in rapid SMS, which will give you, which will give the capability to your application to use GTOC, for example, which is inbuilt in Vumi and is not in rapid SMS. So that's something that you might want to consider. You might have an application that you have already built, so the application part is working perfectly in rapid SMS, and you want to extend people that can use it easily. So that's when you can consider a Vumi backend, or there are other combinations that you can look at and see. Uh, and from a, you can use a rapid SMS also there. So meaning that you can reuse the application that you have already in rapid SMS. So uh, that's me. Uh, are there any questions? Yes? Um, so I did a lot of talks about uh, the feature code, the smart code, yes. and the number. But what is the, what do you think, do you have any uh, information about the spending habits of uh, people with feature code, especially mm. for online spending? Online in terms of data. My guess is, uh, if you look at, there are quite a few applications that are based on feature phone only, like banking on SMS, which is quite popular in Kenya, meaning that the fact that people have feature phone doesn't mean that they don't have, they're not ready to spend. And there's that ratio about, uh, I might be spending, let's say, 100 rand. If you can have access to 100 people that are all ready to spend two rand, in terms, so from a financial perspective, that's something better for your company. So it might not necessarily be how much does one person spend. It might be how many people do you tap into or do you do use your application? Yeah, just asking, do you, do you have access to that kind of information so you can obviously do a understanding with, with work while building your application and that track hmm. the cost of development? I've not looked into that, but I'm sure that's, uh, that should not be something against feature phone. Uh, my argument is, if that was the case, uh, there's, a, there's lots of on banking that happens only on SMS in regions like Kenya, and SMS being, it means not smartphone, and they have been quite successful, they have been running for a while. So I can look and tell you exactly what project that is. Cool, any more questions? Yes. Uh, it depends. When you, if you have a subscription service, the question you need to ask yourself is, who will be paying for the interaction? So in a USSD, there are messages going back and forth. And you can decide either as a company to be the one paying for it, or the user can be the one paying for it. So, when you, uh, so typically, in the terms and condition of your services, when you get people to subscribe, that's where you decide. So if you are the one paying for it, it's likely to cost you something. So you need to make sure you make your money back. But if the user is the one paying it, paying for the subscription, even getting uh, information from it, then it becomes a matter of how many people will try to use the service, 
which is something people usually play on. But you can build a strategy depending on how much, what's your budget, and what's your target uh, market, so people you are going to reach to make that profitable. Yes. So if I'm getting you right, you want to know what, uh, so half, so what's the minimum in terms of time and also in terms, because oh, time. So when, is it, when does it become not worth it? When you it, it? It depends. So let's say if you have an application, you can use the USSD access as a marketing point. So let's say you can use USSDs to get people to know about your application. And when they want to do the heavy lifting, the things that require a lot of data, and that will require too many back and forth, they have to switch to the website. So let, uh, if, for example, so let's, uh, a typical case is in the healthcare sector. You, people use USSDs to, get, to send reminders to people, give feedback. So today you need to do this, or have you done this? Here's how you should react. Uh, and that's an, as an alternative to the person having to go to the hospital and see someone. So in that case, you are get, they are getting from it, the user and both the hospital, because they don't need to spend that much for the person traveling. And in terms, they can manage the time the doctor use better. Uh, so now, can you give me more specific, in, because if, I, I, if we have specific cases, then we can discuss is it really reliable or is it not? So checking, uh, most of the cases uh, we have seen so far is to check something for USSDs. So you want to check, let's say, your account balance. You want to check, uh, in this case, in the case of degree, you want to check what is happening. Uh, uh, is the drug valid? So you are, it's more like a get and you're not getting a lot of information, meaning that it can be displayed on your screen. If it was a lot of information, then actually scrolling through all the text, that won't be, real, that won't be good. So I would suggest if, as long as what you want to do or the data you're sending to the user is not too much, go for it. And as long as the back and forth is not too much. So typically, when you use uh, when you use USSDs, you won't see people the back and forth going ten times. Typically, even if you are checking your credit, then you are checking your internet airtime. Those are two separate things. If there's too much interaction, because I myself as a user, if I have to enter ten things sequentially, then by the time I enter the sixth, I'm have forgotten the first. So from a user experience, if you can, you can also build your workflow so that 10 points that can, uh, 10 input that the user needs to provide you to get what he wants out of the system is reduced in two, three steps. That will make it more user friendly. So it's more a matter of if you are, if you are inventive and you take that interaction and the user experience into account, you definitely, there's room for you to make your application useful. And it's not a matter of moving your whole application there. Taking constraint like how much data is required and all that might mean that you move only part of your application. Because this, uh, what do you gain from your application? So that's one of the things you need to look at. So, moving part of the typical user workflow to USSDs or SMS might mean that 
Because your customer can now check it everywhere he wants, he knows it's important and he will stick with you. And that's investing on the long term for your business. So I'm totally uh, okay. So you are right in saying that not everything can be moved to USSD, definitely. But moving some of it, and it also gives you the opportunity to build that knowledge in-house and start using it now. So that by the time it becomes uh, used everywhere or people are asking for it, you know about it. Yes? Uh, is usually driven by the contract that exists with the telecommunication companies. There's always a cost, and when, uh, you, when signing the contract, so like in our case, we had to go to various countries, talk to various telecommunication companies, and you tell them who is paying, so it's part of the contract. So you can decide that I'm the one paying, so it means that it, for the user it's free. All the SMSs get charged to my account. And if you say the other way around, that the user is paying, then the user is paying. It gets reduced from your airtime every time they use it. So it's at your own discretion. Any other? Yes? Uh, Vumi, in particular, uh, if you go to Prekel, you can uh, sign a contract with Prekel, who has contract with some telecommunication companies in some countries. So if you want to use those, then you might, so you won't have to go and see all the telecommunication companies. So that's something I'm sure you can talk to a Prekel guy to give you the details. So then it's up to, uh, and the other alternative that we went for is you actually go and see the communication company. So it's up to you to see what's feasi feasible and what's more reasonable. So going the service option, so Prekel and using the uh, Vumi as a service means that there's some things that they will do for you, they will make your life easier. So, yes. So that's something you need to actually sit and look at the numbers, look at your budget, and take it from there. Yes? Uh, so you in terms of volume of messages or user base? Uh, that's something you need to discuss in the contract. In our case, when we were testing the application, we had a number cut off because we received a few thousand SMS in an hour. So that wasn't mentioned in the contract. And when it cut, they cut it, the number, so they thought it was an error on the system or an error on our side. So that's uh, definitely something you might want to mention in the contract to say for this. Uh, but because it, it might also be country dependent. So because as a telco company, the more SMS is happening on their network, the more money comes in for them. So they might be happy you, for you to only go forward. And if they charge you, for example, that the minimum, uh, the minimum payment they need from you every month is, let's say, $200. And if uh, $200, if you convert it to SMS, it represents, let's say, 1000 or two. Then it's entirely, so if you don't reach the, that level, they still charge you, charge you for that amount. So it's more in the terms of the contracts. But typically, they won't aim for a specific uh, bar or a specific minimum, at least from my experience. So it might vary with uh, the different companies and the different countries. We have time for one more. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> one, one more good one. 
From my experience, uh, the companies, we, the telecommunication company we talked with, they were giving option of both. So it was my decision from when signing the contract, who will we build for it. The tricky thing is, generally, when you see most of the advertisement using SMSs, in the term of, and condition, they will tell you that every time you send the SMS, you are being billed for it. So as long as, even in the case of UUSDs, as long as they have told you that, by a mean, or they give you the opportunity to check it out. It might be legal. Does that make sense? I, I just heard of the agreement that people are having getting debited. I was just wondering, is, is it the USSD that has been abused to take money off a person's account? I've heard it's been happening. I'm not 100% sure. I don't want to yeah. talk to the USSD. Uh -huh. Both SMS and USSD, there's always a charge from the telecommunications company side. What do you mean by without the user actually knowing? Can you send use that the debit coming off the user's account without the user knowing? Uh, it's, so the, the way I understand it, so because it, it seems as if I don't get what you're trying to say. So I when. I'm wondering if it's going to be around for that long. Can you build the infrastructure around it if there is that abuse? I can't name it, so it's actually a really bad thing. I'm not trying to quote anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, it seems like you guys have something. Yeah, um, uh, I'm not sure if this is a great answer for you, but in terms of people value added services provided by uh, the, the network provider, so there are some subscription based services where you opt in, as people tend to do, the, the, the organization you are providing the right the, the services, the ones who are opting in, so such as the web pages. Yes, it comes down to the term and conditions. So do you know, and can you opt out? Yes? Um, but like in that line, um, with this abuse kind of happening, what's the reputational problems with USD and SMS if this kind of thing is happening for you to invest like a lot of, um, of your company's resources into developing these systems? Mm. If the reputational factor of USD is going to that point that is being abused, so that the users mm. don't necessarily think it's a good option. It's more we, we just need to take it you guys sure. if anyone is really interested in the USSD abuse and mm. whatever, take it offline and sure. we can take it up there. Thanks a lot, Thank you. Thank you.